The second episode of any television series is always one of the most important, because it can make or break the show by showing whether the momentum of the opening episode can be maintained over time. One of the prime examples of a disappointing second episode is Doctor Who's The Beast Below, where the Doctor takes brand new companion Amy Pond on a trip to the Starship UK, which is being carried by a Starwell that is being tortured by the human passengers. Moffat wanted the episode to emphasise his fairy tale vision of Doctor Who, along with filling the narrative with philosophical and political commentary. However, The Beast Below has always been considered one of the weaker Series 5 episodes, and until very recently, even Moffat himself considered it the worst Doctor Who episode he had ever written. Indeed, not only is it forgettable, it's extremely rushed and padded, along with weak characters and a completely wasted imaginative setting. So what exactly makes this episode so disappointing and bad? And is there anything that can actually redeem it? Well, saddle up on a giant space world and make sure you have enough social credit to watch this video, because it's time to review the Beast Below. I'm the bloody Queen Mate. I really like the Starship concept behind this episode. I've always been fascinated by the idea of generation ships, giant vessels relying on generations of passengers to maintain it over the course of its journey, rather than cryogenically freezing them. It's always been one of my favourite sci-fi concepts, and there is a similar idea behind Starship UK. A Roman city of sorts, in the same vein as Mortal Engines, except on a much bigger scale since this is an entire nation. The backstory also makes a lot of sense within the world building of the episode. In the distant future, the Earth is partially destroyed by solar flares. So the only solution is fleeing the planet en masse and becoming a nomadic race as things settle down or people colonise other planets. In other words, going to the Winchester and waiting for everything to blow over. Therefore, it's to be expected that our Earthbound nations would remain just being carried into the stars. Because what else would you do in this situation? There are limited ships and a couple billion humans to evacuate, so it is just easy to maintain nations. I feel like the steampunky aesthetic of the ship reflects this makeshift mass evacuation. This isn't some sleek futuristic star destroyer. This is just something people have had to literally cobble together. So they would have had to have put in stuff that would just work rather than stuff that looks cool. I think the whole idea of reverting back to bicycles and more stripped down yet reliable technology crafts a unique identity for both the ship itself and the people who live there, especially because you get Lancashire being the Death Star trash compactor, which makes me dread to think what happened to Kent, because it's bad enough already. The ship is a really good sci-fi concept unlike anything we've seen before outside of maybe the Ark. So it's a shame that this didn't become the new Earth of the Moffat era, coming back for more adventures in such a distinctive location. The other key component of the Starship UK setting is the political narrative it spins, showing us this dystopian society where people are allowed to vote on the Star World's freedom every five years, but being punished unless they choose to forget the truth. I'll get into the specifics of this in a minute, but I do think this part of the story is a bit disappointing, because it suffers from Moffat's more fairy tale and child-friendly approach to Doctor Who. It doesn't fully embrace the horror of Starship UK society. I mean, it starts off promising, with underperforming students not having enough China social credit points to ride lifts, but it immediately ruins it with the unintentionally cringeworthy and laughable lift scene. How do you take this seriously when you've got a child reading out a poem and the absolutely awful looking smilers? And don't get me wrong, I love a good Zoltar machine, but these look terrible. Unlike other distinctive Moffat monsters like the Gasmar Zombies or Vashtra Narada, the Smilers don't fit into the aesthetic of the story, feeling very out of place in the society. They don't look friendly when they're happy, but they also don't look intimidating when they're angry. They just look bad. And it's actually funny as the script turns to you and says, Oh look, they have a third evil face. Yeah, I bet you're terrified now, aren't you? It's obvious that they wanted these monsters to be nightmare fuel by straddling the line between harmless and evil, but they simply aren't either. They just serve as a really weak villain for the piece. And on top of that, we don't even know how their counterpart winders work. They're the android secret police, but why are they part Smiler? It's just style over substance, rather than actually having interesting or scary villains. Even when they do pose a direct threat, Liz 10 just shows up and kills them instantly without even a chase sequence, which highlights the terrible pacing, no flow to the episode thanks to all the padding. The story has no real structure, and Moffat seemingly couldn't find interesting ways to move from beat to beat, so the half-baked action scenes feel pointless and unnecessary. 
The Beast Below is notable for being Amy Pond's first trip in the TARDIS, floating up in space as the Doctor looks up her dress. Now I appreciate the consistency of her still being in her nightgown because it maintains the tradition of other first outings in New Who, but the line of sight definitely makes this look a bit dodgy. No wonder Amy wanted to bonk him. It is a nice scene though, driving home the spaceship capabilities of the TARDIS. I'll always love these kinds of visuals, seeing the wide expanse of space through those unassuming wooden doors, illustrating the vast possibilities of such an impossible time and space machine. Another significant part of this opening is Moffat driving home the Doctor's supposed non-interference policy. This is a really weird thing to establish, because it feels like Moffat only wrote it to fit the end of the episode, rather than to show an actual element of the Doctor's character. The 11th Doctor doesn't become an incarnation synonymous with non-interference. It's only in the Snowmen much later that he tries to stay out of events. Every other time, he's more than willing to interfere. So what was the point of this, especially as Moffat subverts it literally seconds later. You never interfere in the affairs of other peoples or planets, unless there's children crying. It makes absolutely no sense, doesn't at all fit the tone nor writing of the show, and it just feels like Moffat trying to be clever and thematic, which pretty much sums up the episode as a whole. This bad opening is made worse by the Doctor spewing out exposition of this being a police state. Sure, the Doctor always knows everything, but this scene is written way too handholdy. All the Doctor and Amy have seen is a little girl crying, and apparently that instantly means a police state. The viewer, on the other hand, has already seen the whole lift segregation social credit stuff, so it feels like a useless speech only in there as stylistic fluff. It's literally just a child crying. It's what they spend half their time doing because they're children. You don't need some stupid Sherlock dialogue about silent crying and parents not acting on their instincts because police state. The episode shows us cloaked men following the Doctor around and mysterious observers, so we can tell it's a police state without it being rammed down our throat through dialogue. It's a weird case of Moffat trying to show and tell, so it just really rubs me the wrong way because it feels like he's trying to show off how clever he is. This is about a minute's worth of dialogue telling the viewer what they have already seen, but the episode tries to be all clever about it. It's annoying and doesn't give the audience the chance to form their own conclusions. You don't need the Doctor to narrate the entire situation to make him seem clever. It's patronising and waste time. Just have him point out the unusual cleanliness of the Smilers, but it's all you need. It's all made worse because the exact same sequence has the perfect use of the Doctor's knowledge. He looks at a glass of water and we don't find out why, until later when it's revealed that the water was still because there's no engines. It feels incredibly satisfying and clever, because it was set up and had time to mellow, for the audience to wonder what was happening, rather than the Doctor sitting there narrating the complexities of a glass of water on a spaceship immediately afterwards. Now, believe me, I do like Moffat, I think he is a great writer and has crafted some of the best Doctor Who stories of all time, but episodes like these show how insufferable his scripts can often be, when he tries to be clever and flawed it, since it actively takes you out of the experience and makes you feel like you have no power as a viewer. And of course, because this is Moffat, we even get a snarky child who knows it all. Yeah, when your friend kept bumping into me. Great, thanks a lot, you really couldn't resist shoehorning that in, could you? At least we get Magpie Electricals, which redeems this hunk of junk just a little bit, since I always like to production easter egg whenever it crops up. But wait, Amy, oh no, you can't continue because... There's a hole, we have to go back. Is that where the actual competent and semi-decent episode went? Pretty sure it fell in the hole. In the meantime, the Doctor meets the mysterious Queen Liz 10. I'm the bloody Queen, mate. Get it? She's the Queen, but she speaks like a typical Londoner. Isn't that quirky? Just ignore the fact that she's a figurehead of a dystopian police state. Look at the guns, not her being fine with underperforming children being fed to a whale or becoming slaves. At least they explain that she's just as in the dark as everyone else, having been held in a 10 year cycle of mind wipes so that they can keep the charade up, even if she was the one who started this all to begin with. Yes, she's actually 300 years old, and also always chooses to forget the star well. I find it strange the episode doesn't really explore the true extent of this horrifying Groundhog Day scenario she always finds herself in. She spends most of the time skulking around being paranoid of her own government before repeating it over and over again. It makes her look a bit useless and borderline incompetent as a queen. Liz 10 also brings up another issue I have with the Moffat era. I mentioned in my 11th hour review that I didn't like the hero worship communicated through everyone in Ledworth knowing about the Doctor thanks to Amy's childhood stories. It felt strange because this is the beginning of a brand new era, so it feels redundant because it continues to perpetuate one of the most criticised cornerstones of the Russell T Davis era. And the difference is, that era had actually built the characterization, but in the Moffat era it goes out of its way to continue it, for basically no reason. Indeed, Liz 10 has been raised on the tales of a mysterious eccentric stranger swooping in and saving the world throughout time. 
It does make sense that the Doctor would be a mythical legend, especially because of their run-ins with the royal family, but it just rubs me the wrong way that the first five episodes of Series 5 having characters gushing over the Doctor and saying how much they love him. It makes it more irritating than the Davis era ever was when it comes to hero worship, because it's too forced without that natural slow build-up, and it's more blatant and on the nose than ever. And also there's nowhere else for me to talk about this line, but we see the return of the Planet of the Dead line almost verbatim. You look human. No. You look Time Lord. Hmm, I'm still not sure if I get it. Maybe I need another 200 identical comments explaining it to me. Speaking of characters, Amy is surprisingly blank in this episode. Which is strange because Moffat wrote it intending for her to save the day and prove herself worthy of being a full-time TARDIS traveller. However, it feels like any other companion could have been put in her place and it wouldn't make a difference. Which feels shocking for the first proper adventure of a brand new companion. Obviously, Karen Gillan does well with the poor script she was given, but Amy really doesn't have much of a presence. She's just there to receive exposition after exposition because she doesn't yet know the Doctor as well as the audience does. And even this is massively inconsistent, since she seemingly already knows him well enough to make this big decision revolving around his age and kind nature. Remember, this is her first adventure, only maybe an hour after first stepping into the TARDIS. She barely knows him, so having this sudden wealth of knowledge makes the episode feel out of order with the rest of the series. The weird character dynamic extends to Amy being vilified for trying to protect the Doctor from being put in the impossible position of choosing between the entire colony ship and the last Star Whale in existence. She has only just started travelling with him. She doesn't yet know what he's been through with the genocide he's committed, so obviously she wouldn't be able to comprehend the importance of her decision. Yet the story actively makes her appear to be a bad person for this, which in my opinion feels counterproductive. However, I do like the scene as Amy finds out the history of Starship UK, even if someone in the production team can differentiate between 6 and 8. Age. 1306. You know, between this and Roy's ID being issued in 1990, I'm starting to think they had a toddler in the production team dealing with all the numbers. Anyway, the scene is quite chilling, serving as a horrific example of the ignorance of pseudo-democracy. People are given the choice to forget what they see or do something about it, and they always choose ignorance. They're happy to accept the totalitarian state because it keeps them alive. They know about the Star Well, but they always choose to forget so that they can actually live with themselves for doing this. Which mirrors the reality of people overlooking atrocities because they don't want to feel responsible about doing anything to stop it. The voting isn't actually a choice, it's the illusion of one. It just allows for people to feel like they have a choice when they're actually just given the state permission to continue. It's dark and chilling, this ultimate dystopian framing about how scared we are of taking responsibility for our own actions and would willingly forget under the pretense that we would ever choose otherwise. It's a window into our own world, but that also brings up one of my major criticisms of the episode. It feels like a scrapped Russell T Davis story. Now I know I always get accused of being a Davis fanboy, but it's undeniable that he has always excelled with these biasing political commentaries, never shy of making massive statements. I can't help but feel like he would have been the better writer to convey the commentary of this narrative. It feels like Moffat was scared to commit at some moments, but too on the nose at other times, with actors awkwardly delivering lines like And once every five years everyone chooses to forget what they've learned. Democracy in action. I love the exploration of the illusion of choice, but the episode definitely messes it up, especially because it ends with the Doctor happily allowing this police state to presumably continue killing dissenters. But hey, they're no longer torturing the animals, so it's all happy happy. Just ignore the authoritarian government that still maintains power through fear and oppression. It's actually quite funny, Moffat accidentally contradicting his own political commentary. Whoops, so much for this. We're bringing down the government. This government takes the Doctor, Amy and the Queen down to the Star World's torture chamber, where he gets really angry at humanity. This scene is actually quite reminiscent of Planet of the Ood, even down to the sounds of suffering that regular people can't hear. It's poignant, confronting the viewer with such a horrific reminder of our own treatment of animals, forcing them to do our bidding even if they actually want to. And because of this emotional morality, the Doctor gets very angry at Amy for basically no reason. I don't even remember doing it. You did it, that's what counts. I find this moment very uncharacteristic. I don't even know if it's supposed to be, because he doesn't really get punished for being a dick. I understand he would be absolutely sickened by what he has discovered and hate the human race for it, but it's nothing new. As I said, Planet of the Ood, 
big alien brain being tortured and the Ud forced into slavery. He didn't try and kick Donna out of the TARDIS then, so why would he kick Amy out when she was forced to make an impossible decision on her literal first outing? What was she expected to do? She didn't decide for him. She was overwhelmed with something she didn't know how to handle. So him blaming her just feels wrong, and he doesn't even get called out on it, since the episode leaves it to Amy to seemingly redeem herself. However, I do like the idea that he's in such an impossible position that he won't even call himself the Doctor after this story, really selling you on the weight of such a decision, because it's that severe and significant. And luckily for the Doctor, there's the power of children. Since Amy has a convenient flashback realising that the Starwell saving the planet was because it didn't want children to cry. How unbelievably Moffat of it. Yes, this entire crisis is averted because Amy remembers it doesn't eat children. So somehow that proves it's good, even though it eats adults. Because this all doesn't feel cheap and pretentious at all. It came because it couldn't stand to watch your children cry. Indeed, luckily for everyone, Amy is right, and she even gives this insufferably poetic Moffat speech, culminating in this painfully forced line. If you were that old, and that kind, and the very last of your kind. Get it? It's like the Doctor! I really don't like this ending. The narrative seemingly abandons its themes all of a sudden, and the ending just happens. Again, it's the typical Moffat approach of style over substance. It's the same as it ever was, people talking a lot without saying anything. This ending is meant to be some grand, heroic moment of defiance, but it feels hollow and rushed, forming a very unsatisfying conclusion to a story that was trying to be really stark and illuminating with its political themes. It just gives up by introducing a magical, cop-out fourth way. Very old and very kind and the very, very last. Sound a bit familiar? Get it? It's like the Doctor! It feels like Moffat wasn't sure the audience would understand the thematic link, so he beats you over the head of it like he's a caveman whose cave painting you defiled. It's so heavy handed and frustrating. And don't forget the tacked on poem in the final shot, Moffat once again patting himself on the back for being so clever and thought provoking. Here Stephen, have this medal for your genius writing. Oh thanks Stephen, you should get one too, you are so clever. Funnily enough, I was originally considering making this video a Defending the Despised, since I remembered The Beast Below being underrated and unfairly hated. However, rewatching it now was a horrible experience. It felt like an absolute chore to sit through. It's full of Moffat trying to be clever and show off at the expense of the narrative itself. There's a lot of patronising dialogue as the script tries to be Sherlock in space, but instead of being clever, it just walks you through things you already know. The pacing is dreadful, feeling really rushed at the end, suddenly wrapping things up whilst leaving a lot of things hanging. It pulls its punches when it comes to action and excitement, so these moments feel wasted and pointless, because it doesn't commit to being a very ponderous, character-oriented episode. The political commentary is brilliant on paper and creates a great framework for the episode, but the details in the actual execution don't do it justice, so it flounders and peters out with a disappointing solution. Even though it isn't, The Beast Below feels like a Davis era episode awkwardly recycled for the Smith era, so it doesn't fit in with the stories around it, one of the only overtly political narratives in the entire Smith run, but it lacks the slickness and thematic weight these kinds of stories had in that previous era. It's simply style over substance and despite being one of the shortest episodes in all of New Who, it feels extremely padded and ends up very forgettable. As a result, I would probably give The Beast Below a low D ranking on the Series 5 tier list, and that's only because I'm feeling generous. I know a lot of people have been coming around on the episode and now consider it underrated, but I just find it so disappointing, squandering so many good concepts like the fantastic Starship UK setting. The villains are weak and badly handled, with their characters weirdly written, and it's all capped off with some absolutely insufferable Moffat moments. So I won't be rewatching it anytime soon, and I wouldn't recommend you do either. And I'd like to give an extra special thank you to my Platinum level patron, Fallon Cortez, and all my Gold level patrons, Alex Marston, Calvin, Daniel Shilato, Francois AK Line Vortex, George, Herna Verzog, and Stefan Ever Miller. Thank you so much for your support.